Back to the schematic, here is a condensed view of what the GS pathway provides, which essentially summarizes what we have just discussed. As a side note, I want to mention that the S in the Alpha S subunit is conveniently chosen to be S because the subunit stimulates adenylyl cyclase. This pathway is in direct opposition with the Alpha I pathway, which as you can see stands for inhibitory. As you can see, the Alpha I pathway is essentially the same in its shape, but the result from Alpha I binding to adenylyl cyclase is inhibition. As a result, the levels of CAMP active PKA and overall phosphorylation are decreased. Now that we have covered the GS and GI pathways, let's consider the GQ pathway. Just like the other GPCR pathways we have covered, the mechanisms begins with the ligand of the GPCR binding to it and causing a conformational change to the receptor. The G protein binds to the receptor and that causes the subsequent exchange of GDP for GTP. Here again, this exchange causes the dissociation of the alpha-Q and beta-gamma subunits. The active alpha-Q then stimulates phospholipase C, also known as PLC, which is a particular enzyme with the main role of hydrolyzing substrates. When active, the substrate that PLC hydrolyzes is phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-biphosphate, or more simply known as PIP2. When we take a look at the molecular structure of PIP2, you can see that there are two main components. First, there is a ring with three phosphate groups that is called inositol 145 triphosphate or IP3. And secondly, there are two fatty acid chains that form diacylglycerol or simply DAG. The hydrolysis of PIP2 leads to the production of two second messengers, DAG and IP3. Now, as you can see, DAG is hydrophobic and remains in the membrane. The formation of DAG will lead to the recruitment of protein kinase C or PKC. PKC is a monomeric kinase that has a catalytic and regulatory subunit. To remove the inhibition from the regulatory subunit, the kinase binds with DAG at the membrane. Then, just like PKA, PKC phosphorylates substrates to generate cellular responses and then the phosphorylation is removed by phosphatases. Now, the other substrate made from PIP2 is IP3. In comparison to DAG, IP3 is diffusible in the cytosol. One of its important downstream functions is being a ligand for the IP3 receptors that are located on the membrane of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum in cells is usually known to be a site for lipid synthesis, but one other important function is being a storage site for calcium. Since there is way more calcium inside the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it turns out that upon opening, IP3 receptors let calcium flow out into the cytosol. Now that there is calcium in the cytosol, it gets very interesting because calcium has a lot of functions as a second messenger. In previous discussions, we've talked about calcium as being the signal for transmitter release, but it turns out that calcium has many more roles as a second messenger. For example, calcium can bind to the rionidine receptors that are also on the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and this leads to the opening of calcium-gated channels in the membrane, which lets even more calcium flow into the cytosol. Moreover, calcium can bind to the small cytoplasmic protein named calmodulin. The calcium-calmodulin complex then activates the calcium-calmodulin-dependent kinase, also commonly referred to as CAMK. Like the other kinases we've discussed, CAMK goes on to phosphorylate other substrates. Again, these substrates can include ion channels, vesicle proteins, transcription factors, and so on and so forth. Now, as a small tangent, I want to touch briefly on the structure of one particular subtype of CAMK kinase, which is the type 2, or simply CAMK2, because it has a particular property that differentiates it from other kinases. So, similar to other kinases, CAMK2 has catalytic subunits that are inhibited by regulatory domains at rest. To remove this inhibition, it requires binding of the calcium calmodulin complex. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Once it's activated, CAMK2 can phosphorylate itself by a process of autophosphorylation, which can make the enzyme persistently active even when the calcium is not there anymore. This kinase is very important because it has important implications for neuronal plasticity, which is a concept we'll discuss later. All right, now that we've covered the main events of the GQ pathway, here is what it looks like as a whole. As a small detail, I want to mention that calcium heavily contributes to the activation of PKC, 
So this is a noteworthy detail to consider. Now, the pathway is very complex, so make sure to go slowly through it to understand, and if there's any issues with it, make sure to let me know. Back to the schematic, we can simply summarize the GQ pathway in this way. The activation of alpha-Q leads to the activation of PLC, then formation of two second messengers, DAG and IP3, and then the activation of kinases that increase the phosphorylation inside the cell and the activation of calcium-dependent proteins. All right, we've now covered what I generally wanted to discuss when it comes to GPCRs. Obviously, there are a lot of details to add on to what I showed, which I will do in due time, but for the moment, this should suffice us to get good grasp of what is the function of GPCRs. Let's now cover the tyrosine kinase receptors, which are the second main class of metabotropic receptors. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.